One, two, three. There we go. Now it's on. Okay. You good? There we go. Thank you. I'm going to start with the video. No volume. It's the building. It's the complicated building. Not a conspiracy against me, huh? <laughs> Sounds like a whisper, but we can't hear it here. Not uh, plugged into the mics here. Please bear with us as we deal with it here. Some technical difficulties online and in person audience. In the meantime, more people are plugged are into the in mics here. Yeah. So perhaps it's uh, it's for the vast. I was told this mic wasn't on when I was making the introductions before, so people won't have heard. I think I'll just reintroduce once we know that the audio is ready for the video. But just signal me down from the tech heavens when, when we're loaded properly. Oh. No.
a bit on procedure while we wait. Okay, start over. So, right from the beginning. Uh, just so people know, after the talk, there'll be a QA. and a There's a microphone up there. You can queue up behind and we'll get to people in order. Um, I'd like to, again, welcome to the stage, uh, Dr. Yaron Brook, and we'll begin with the video. Thank you. برای توی کوچه رخ زیدن برای ترسیدن به وقت بوسیدن برای خواهرم خواهرت خواهرامون برای تغییر مغز ها که پوسیدن برای شرمندگی برای بی پولی برای حسرت یک زندگی معمولی برای کودک زبال گرد و آرزوهاش برای این اقتصاد دستوری برای این هوای آلوده برای ولی از رو درختای فرسوده برای پیروز و اعتمال انقرازش برای سگهای بیگناه ممنوعه برای گریه های بیوقفه برای تصویر تکرار این لحظه برای چهره ای که میخنده برای دانش آموزا برای هاینده برای اجباری برای نخبه های زندانی برای کودکان افغانی برای این همه برای غیر تکراری برای این همه شعار های تو خالی برای آوار خونه های پوشاری برای احساس آرامش برای خرشی پس از شبای طولانی برای غرس های حساب و بیخوابی برای مرد میهن آبادی برای دختری که آرزو داشت پسر بود برای زن زندگی آزادی برای آزادی September 13th last year, uh, a young woman by the name of Masha Amini, 22 year old from Kurdish part of Iran, was arrested in Tehran by the morality police. Imagine living in a place that have morality police for not wearing her hijab exactly right. Maybe a few strands of hair were sticking out. Maybe she was showing a little bit too, too much skin according to the police. A few days later, she was dead. The official account was she had died of a heart attack, but it was clear that she had been beaten, beaten into a coma, and she died from that beating three days after the arrest. The next day, protests started in the Kurdish parts of Iraq, protests against the morality police, against what they had done to this particular individual, to this particular young woman. But soon those protests spread and they spread all over Iran. They spread to almost every city and town in Iran, to every university, in particular in Tehran. Many of the universities saw significant massive protests, some of the largest Iran has seen. Uh, and the messaging started to change. Slowly, the messaging got expanded from beyond this one case to messaging around liberty, messaging around freedom, messaging not just around ending the morality police and allowing women to wear burqas. And indeed, in the demonstrations, the women were ripping apart the burqas, throwing them to the ground. If you've seen some of the videos, you can see young women, as young as 10 girls, often teenagers, taking their burqas off, 
often with their backs to the camera so that they cannot be identified. But sometimes out in the street where their faces can be seen and standing up to this idea, up against this idea that somebody else can dictate what they can or what they cannot wear. By September 20th, three days after, there were already clashes with police. There were already clashes with the military, with the uh, Republican Guard, Revolutionary Guard, sorry, Revolutionary Guard, and with the, all the different militias and segments in Iranian society that want to oppress and suppress any form of freedom and liberty. September 28th, this song went online. Um, it was produced by a singer-songwriter by the name of Shavin Hajipur. Uh, Shavin uh, was, before the song, was a darling of uh, the, uh, the regime. Uh, he had won a singing competition, uh, you know, like, uh, like on our television, and won a singing competition, and the regime thought his music was wonderful. Of course, within a day of this song going up online and being viewed by millions of people, Chavin was arrested. Uh, within three days, the song had been viewed by 40 million people. And uh, he was released on, quote, bail, primarily because I think the regime was afraid of how popular he was and the consequences of keeping him in jail, given how popular he is. The song itself, if you notice the little uh, uh, tweets underneath it, the song is composed by, a, he basically asked people, why are you protesting? What are the protests about for you? And then he picked, picked and choose different sentences, different phrases from them and incorporated them into, uh, into the song. September 30th in Iran is known today as Bloody Friday, in particular in one city, Zahaidan, and I apologize for butchering the names. Um, uh, uh, the authorities there opened fire killing at least 50 people. To date, at least 500 people have been killed in the demonstrations. Who knows how large the number really is, but at least 500 have been killed. Um, and demonstrations have continued since. On and off, different places, smaller places, larger places, uh, but they are ongoing. They're ongoing today. Part of the problem is that the Iranian regime has cut off the internet, has done everything they can to cut them off on the internet completely so that it's very difficult to get videos out, to get information out, to actually know what is going on. On December 4th, the regime claimed that they were disbanding the so-called morality police as a way to appease uh, the demonstrators. Demonstrators continues, because now the demonstration is not just about the morality police. It's about changing the regime. It's about death to the Ayatollah. It's about a true revolution in terms of liberty and freedom and bringing, uh, bringing the ability to vote, uh, and, and, you know, it, it, it's got to the point where I, I, I think Puya, who is from Iran, said a few days ago, told me, said, it, it, it feels like a moral revolution. This is not just about politics. This is about people up standing up for their own lives, standing up to live the best, you know, lives based on their own choices. And it's not just the young anymore. It's their parents supporting them. It's, of course, not everybody in society, but it's a growing number of people within Iran are rising up against a theocracy that has ruled since 1979 and has ruled brutally, brutally since 1979. There have been uprisings before in terms of demonstrations and protests and so on, but usually those have been focused on a particular issue like economic stress. Never have the calls been, there have been so many calls and so consistently across the board for actually replacing the regime, for actually seeing the downfall of the Ayatollah. Even religious Iranians now have given up on the concept of a theocracy. Iran today, I think a majority of Iranians, an overwhelming majority of Iranians are ready for something new and something different and something better. Interestingly enough, while these demonstrations and protests were going on in Iran, we saw something similar happening in China. Now, protests in China have been going on for a long time. And indeed, if you know something about China, there seem to be always protests in China. There's always somebody somewhere protesting about something all over China. Very little makes it out of China because of the, the, the way 
uh, social media structured over there, the censorship, and because foreign media is in the big cities, but it's not out in the countryside. But there's almost always demonstrations going on in China. But what happened in the last few months has been unique. Now, uh, ostensibly, the cause of this is COVID. And you can ask me in the Q&A, but maybe, maybe COVID had something to do with other events that are going on in the world uh, in terms of demonstrations, because it's not even just Iran and China. But, uh, you know, in April 2022, Shanghai was locked down. I mean, locked down. People couldn't leave their homes. They, they you know, they, they, people were, literally had no food. Uh, they, they relied on food delivery and the delivery, the, the, the stores ran out, the delivery stores ran out, couldn't, people couldn't leave. It, I mean, there was real, uh, there was real angst among the population in, in, uh, in Shanghai and there was real distress and there was fear of real starvation, fear of starvation like they hadn't seen since the, uh, since the 1960s under Mao. And here they are living in a place where a significant proportion of the population of Shanghai you would consider middle class and they're starving because the authorities will not let them out because they have a zero COVID policy and you can't go out under any circumstances. So there was already some protests around that starting in the late spring. But by the fall, lockdowns were rolling all over China. City after city was being locked down, completely shut down. And then in October of 2020, there was a protest. Uh, there was a protest in a, a, a small place, but it was, uh, there's a, a Sitong Bridge, it's called. And on this bridge, somebody hand this flyer, call, you know, this big you know, uh, poster, uh, calling for a change in the regime in China, calling for democracy in China. This was immediately uh, filmed immediately made it up on social media. The censors immediately took it down, but by the time it took it down, millions and millions of people around China had seen it. There was something happening that was more than just COVID. Um, in early November, there were various demonstrations. I don't know if you saw the video of Foxconn in November 22nd and 23rd, employees at Foxconn had been locked into the factory, into the dorms at the factory, and were not allowed to leave, not allowed to go home for months because of the zero COVID policy. And they were breaking out, they were escaping, they were beating up the police, they were running away, they were getting out of it. They were not tolerating it. And again, videos of this made it onto social media in China, censors took it off, but millions of people in the meantime saw these videos. People were standing up to the authorities, something that is very unusual in China. Again, the demonstrations all the time, but they're small, they don't get a lot of press. They don't make it a lot on social media. And nobody has a sense that there's something moving here. But in China, they really seem to be. And then in November 24th, there was a demonstration in Chongqing. And again, I'm butchering the name, so I apologize. And a speaker at this demonstration, again, filmed, streamed on social media, declared, give me liberty or give me death. Straight out of Patrick Henry. The same day, tragically, there was a fire at a, uh, at a, a, a residential uh, building in Urumqi, something like that, uh, which is in the province in Western uh, China where the Uyghurs, who are the oppressed minority in China, who are often, uh, you know, we talk, they talked about concentration camps and, re, quote, re-education camps for the Uyghurs all over Western China. There was a fire there among this minority where 10 people died. And part of the reason they died was that the authorities, the fire department couldn't get to the building fast enough because of the COVID restrictions, because of the lockdowns. And they were stuck in this home and people died for no reason. And that, and all, the, all of the you know, uh, 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 bottled up anxiety around the COVID lockdowns and around all just exploded into a wave of demonstrations all over China for the first time ever, I think, since Tiananmen Square, really, since 1989. There were demonstrations in every major city in China. There were demonstrations in all the universities, which is particularly unusual. All the university students went out and demonstrated. Um, you know, in, uh, in, uh, and then in, in uh, November 26, this is November 26, 
this expands and in Nanjing, a, a girl uh, stood out there and she brought a, a white page. And she stood with a white page, just like this, being filmed again, everything going up on social media. You see, there is some value in social media. Um, and somebody took the page from her. And a white page represents in China not only mourning, it represents uh, uh, mourning for, but it also, the idea of a blank white page represents, I cannot speak. I cannot say. I cannot write. I have no freedom of speech. All I can show you is a blank white page. Well, as soon as that page was ripped from her hands and some other students saw her, hundreds of students came to where she had stood with blank pages. And it became the symbol of the demonstrations in China, these white pages that they were displaying out to the public. Shanghai saw some of the largest protests, but these were really across the entire country. Uh, following a few days where the regime seemed to have let these demonstrations happen, they started clamping down. They started uh, uh, beating protesters up, arresting many of them. We have no idea how many. Just like we, we to this day don't know how many people were killed in Tiananmen Square. We have no clue. It, it ranges from thousands to tens of thousands, and nobody really knows. The same today with the tensions in China. We do not know. But the days following November 26, in late November and early December, were days of demonstrations and massive police attacks. Some protesters started calling not just for zero COVID to go away, but they started calling not, and, and not just for free speech in the, in, the, in, in the sense of these white papers, but they started explicitly calling for Xi to be kicked out and for the Communist Party to fall. They started explicitly calling for give me liberty or give me death, give me democracy, give me freedom, get rid of the regime as it exists today. So for the first time, again, since Tiananmen, the regime felt threatened. There were actual calls in the streets all over China for the regime to fall, for the regime, to be, the regime itself to be eliminated. Remember, this is just after the Communist National Conference, which had just elected Xi basically to a lifetime appointment as dictator of China. So this was a real slap in his face um, and a real slap a challenge to the regime. Starting November 30th, the police came out on huge scale. They blocked streets. They started stopping people before they even got to the demonstration, just in the street, requiring them to get IDs. They looked in their, in their bags for blank white papers. And if you had a blank white paper in your bag, they shuttle you off somewhere. Uh, so all of this, uh, you know, all of this, I think, uh, uh, caused the regime to really uh, be scared to challenge them. They were afraid that this was going to blow up in their face. And in December 7th, they did away with zero COVID. Uh, and indeed, China's completely opened up in terms of COVID. All restrictions of COVID have gone. Nothing. Travel everywhere. Uh, it, everything has been eliminated. No other freedoms have been restored. Uh, but all of that, all the COVID restrictions went away. It's interesting that at about the same time in 2020, we saw demonstrations in Cuba. Uh, there's a massive flow of immigrants out of Cuba right now. I don't know if you know this, but larger than at any point in time of Cuban, there are more Cuban migrants leaving Cuba right now than at any point in time in the history of, in, of communist Cuba. Uh, some of that has, again, to do with COVID and demonstrations and clampdowns and restrictions. We know what's going on in Russia. Or maybe we know what's going on in Russia. If you demonstrate against the war, if you speak up against the war, you go to jail. It's considered treason. You can't, if you demonstrate, there were, demonstrate, there were demonstrations about a year ago at the beginning of the war. There were demonstrations. Those demonstrators were rounded up and taken to jail, and they've disappeared. Hundreds of thousands of young men in particular have left Russia. They're in Kazakhstan, and they're in Georgia in order to avoid the draft, but also not to be supportive of the regime and, and what is going on. Venezuela is seeing a massive migration out of Venezuela. We're not seeing a lot of demonstrations in the street. I think they've tried that and they got crushed. 
but you're definitely seeing people leaving Venezuela looking for other opportunities. Again, a lot of what we're seeing on the border of the US are Cubans and Venezuelans. You're not seeing a lot of Mexicans. You're seeing Cubans and Venezuelans and Nicaraguas, places that have authoritarian regimes, people are fleeing and they're fleeing in mass on a scale that we just haven't seen in the past. Now, at least in Iran and in China, as we've said, we've seen some positive movement, and I expect we'll see even more in Iran uh, into the future, but we've definitely seen uh, Russia back off of the COVID restrictions, nothing more than that for now. In Iran, supposedly morality police is at least being subdued, if not gone away. Uh, you're seeing today women walk around Tehran without the hijab. Um, you know, they're, they're harassed a lot less than they used to. It used to be that if you walked like that around Tehran just a few months ago, uh, common people, people, just everyday people would harass you. That has stopped. And I think that has stopped because of the demonstration. I think that is a sense in which it's a moral revolution. People have stopped caring about this stuff. The morality police might still care. The regime might still care. The police might still care. Everybody else might still care. But the common person in the street just doesn't care anymore and are letting this happen. And this suggests, I think, that the regime is losing its grip on what is going on. But the consequences are also horrific. People are paying a price for this. And I think it's easy to forget the price that people are really paying for what is happening. In Iran, 20,000 people have been arrested, at least. Again, numbers that we know of. Uh, 100, 100 of those 20,000 so far have been accused of crimes that carry the death sentence. 18 have already been sentenced to death. Four have been executed. Four young people. I mean, I don't know if you've seen the pictures, but these are young kids. Have been hung. 500 plus protesters have been killed. Um, and people's lives are being destroyed. Uh, there's a lot of fear in Iran right now. These, I think these executions are having an impact. Parents are telling their kids, hey, we support you, but don't go out there into the street because they could grab you and you could be the next one hanging from a rope. I mean, think about life where you have to live like that, where you have to live with that kind of fear. In China, as I said, Many of these, um, many people have disappeared. Many people have been arrested. Um, I just have one example that I want to give you of this. On November 27th, a young book editor by the name of Cao Xingxin, apologize for the name again, uh, a young woman, but just about to turn 26, uh, joined a post desk near Beijing. It was a, it was a last minute kind of thing. She got together on social media with her friends and they all decided to go to this protest. Um, they, this was in the, in, the, in the embassy district in Beijing, and the rally uh, was really a vigil uh, for, the, for the people who had died in the fire the two nights earlier. There were a lot of calls during this protest also for replacing the regime, so there's definitely something more radical than, than, uh, than it only being a vigil. But they, they'd stayed, they'd stayed there until after midnight, and then she and seven other of her girlfriends went out, and they went, uh, they went to a you know, they went to grab something to eat, and then they, uh, they got home somewhere before dawn. On the 29th, two days later, knock on her door, and the police were there. Uh, they confiscated all her digital devices. They took her to the local police station for questioning, and then they released her for now. She learned that the police had done the same thing with several of her other friends. And indeed, that's many of them uh, stayed in detention for quite longer than she did. But she was afraid. She was afraid they were coming back. And in anticipation of the fact that they were probably going to come back, she made uh, this video. Hello, I'm Zhi Xin. 
也就是说，当大家看到这段视频的时候，我已经被警察带走了，就像我的其他几位朋友一样。我现在二十六岁。就是刚毕业一年半左右，在一家出版社做编辑。我的朋友们也是和我有，也是和我相似的同龄人。我们都有着自己的工作，我们关注这个社会，我们的同胞遇难时也有合理的情绪想要表达。我们对失去生命的人充满同情，所以我们才去了现场。在这一场成千上万人参与的悼念活动当中，在现场我们遵守着秩序。没有和警察产生任何冲突的情况下，以及在后来把我们定性为 frustrated students protest 之后，为什么还要悄无声息地带走我们？我们不想被凭空消失，我们想知道为什么是我们会被定罪，定罪我们的证据又是什么？以及在没有罪证的前提下，为什么我们可以被这样轻易地带走？如果仅仅是因为我们出于同情去了悼念现场？那么，这个社会还有多少可以容纳我们情绪的空间 ？What strikes me about the song and the video? By the way, she was arrested a day after she made the video. She's still under arrest.、Um, people have no idea what she's going to be exactly charged with. She could be charged with in China with an offense that could sentence her to, to jail for ten, twenty years. What did she do? She attended a demonstration. She spoke her mind. Maybe I don't know if there's even evidence that she, she said anything to upset anybody. But what strikes me about both this video and the song is that here are people trying and asking just to live an ordinary life. They're asking for ordinary things that all of us in Basically, take for granted. What does it mean to have an ordinary life? Because if you think about the song, this line that struck me was yearning for an ordinary life. Well, what does that mean? What is an ordinary life? Well, an ordinary life is choosing what 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 school to go to and choosing what to study and what career to pursue. Not available to women in Iran. They don't get to choose. Many of the professions and many of the fields of study are blocked to them. You've probably heard the stories about Afghanistan, where women now cannot go to school at all at any level; they're just banned from all education. The horror of living in a society like that. It's about choosing who to hang out with, who your friends are, who to hold hands with, who to kiss, who to make love with. But if you're caught holding hands in Iran, you can go to jail for a long time. Never mind kiss or sex. A normal life means choosing what art, entertainment, music you get to consume. But in both China and Iran, those are all censored. Those are all determined for you. You don't get to choose. What lecture to go to, and what music to listen to, and what art to consume? The authorities tell you there is no normal life. Normal life is about things—the the, the most basic thing that we all take to granted, for granted: choosing what to wear, choosing what clothes to put on in the morning. Now, for men, that's easy, even in Iran, I guess. But think what it must be like for women. To have to make sure everything is covered up and they're completely, and it's not what they want. It's not the kind of life they want to live, but it's the kind of life that they are required to live. That they can go to jail or they can be killed if they don't follow the instructions. Choosing whether to dance or not, what dances to dance, can't dance in Iran, not if you're a woman. Choosing, of course, what you can say and what you can't say, what you want to say and to whom. There's no free speech, not in Iran, not in China. We take it for granted. Choosing who to associate with, and of course, choosing who governs you. That is something that neither the Chinese nor the Iranians, nor the Venezuelans nor the Cubans, none of these people have. And the we 
to a large extent, I think, take for granted. And if you listen, if you read the, 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 the song, I mean, what, what is he talking about? Why, why are these demonstrations happening? For dancing in the streets, in a sense, for the right to dance in the streets, for the fear when kissing. But they're demonstrating because they don't want to feel fear when they kiss. And then, you know, a variety of different economic complaints, which, because there are no opportunities for them. You know, he has a line there for the massacre of the innocent dogs. And I was thinking, what's that about? Well, you're not allowed to have a dog as a pet in Iran. That's illegal. And the Iranians have killed massive numbers of dogs, partially to prevent the population from being able to take them as pets. That's the level at which they intervene in people's lives. That's a level at which they're controlling people's lives. But when you think about it in context, this idea that we can choose all those things, this idea that we can make all these choices that we all take for granted, that is very unusual in the history of mankind. Iran and China are typical. We are the exception. 300 years ago, you didn't get to choose your profession. 300 years ago, you didn't get to choose who to marry. 300 years ago, you didn't get to choose what to wear and what not to wear. All of those were dictated to you by whatever regime you happen to be in, whatever country you were at. The kind of ordinary life that we assume is ordinary is extraordinary. What we have is something really special, something really unique. What we have is a freedom that human beings have not known except for the last 250 or so years. It's what we have that is exceptional. And this is why when we see Iran, China, Cuba, Venezuela, I mean, the details might be different, but what we're really looking at is our own past. What we're really looking at is how human beings typically have lived in history, where they had no choices. 300 years ago, you as a, you know, in terms of a profession, you did what your father did. And today it seems obvious to us that women should be able to do what they want to, but that's new. That's very new. Women 300 years ago didn't have choices. They married, they stayed home. There was no profession. There were no professions that women were allowed to participate in. There were exceptions here and there, extraordinary women who somehow broke the rules and got away with it, but that was the exception, not the rule. Human history is about lack of choices. Human history is about lack of freedom, lack of liberty. And I think by taking our own liberty and our own freedom for granted, we risk, we risk not understanding that history and we risk losing the freedoms and the choices and the liberties that we have. It's important for us to recognize what's going on in these other countries, not only because I think the bravery of these people is inspiring, not only because it's sickening to see that this is happening, but as a warning to what could happen to us and as a reminder of how we all were, of how human life has been forever, with the exception of the last couple of hundred years. And this is, this is, to me, the most interesting question maybe in all of human history, the most interesting historical question in all of human history is why do we have freedom? What made what we have, the, the, our ability to make the choices that lead to what we perceive as an ordinary life and is so extraordinary, what made that possible? What in history, what ideas, what events made the modern world possible? Because the modern world is, wow, it's amazing when you start comparing it to our history and to places that have not embraced the, the modernity in this sense. So what is it? What happened 250 years ago to make it possible for us to have the kind of freedom and have that kind of liberty? Because if we don't understand that, how are we going to preserve what we have? If we don't understand that, how can we help them actually attain their freedom? If we don't understand that, we are going to lose our freedoms. 
we are going to lose our liberties. But so to me, the most interesting research topic one could have, the most interesting field to study in history or the history of ideas or the history just generally is what happened. So what happened? I mean, I would argue that there was a period in human history as a consequence, I think, of rediscovering ideas, ancient ideas, ideas that came out of, out of, out of Greece. But as a consequence of rediscovering those ideas, there was a period in human history where all the assumptions that people had had about the world were shattered, were, were at least questioned. For 1,500 years, people had assumed that knowledge came from some form of revelation, some other dimension, some other being. And we, truth was written in ancient books. Truth was revealed to certain philosopher kings, certain people who had particular knowledge and they just dictated it to us. And we just, you know, we didn't have that knowledge. So how could we live for ourselves? How could we, how could we make choices? If, if, you're, if you are incapable of knowing reality, if you're incapable of discovering truth, if you're incapable of connecting with the real world, then how can you live? You need guidance. You need somebody to tell you what to do. Fundamentally, human beings were taught, and I think taught way back, going back to tribal societies, that they are impotent. Their mind is impotent. They require a witch doctor. They require a pope. They require a leader. They require people to guide us, to tell us how and what we should do. They require ancient books with ancient knowledge that we just copy down, memorize, and act on. But that was shattered, I think, during the Renaissance. And in the decades and centuries after that, the shattering started to manifest itself in all kinds of areas. You, maybe you saw it in art first, with the Renaissance, great Renaissance art. And then you saw that, you know, a, a kind of a, a, in that art, you saw kind of a, a self-esteem, a human confidence. You know, Michelangelo's David is not some impotent being that relies on revelation to discover truth. He's a man standing up to a giant with complete focus in his eyes, courageous in front of this monster and knowing that he can beat him. That kind of knowledge does not come from an incompetent, impotent, human being. And then you start seeing it in science from Galileo on scientific discoveries, people using their minds and using and observing the world and discovering truths without reference to the books, indeed, in contradiction to the books, in contradiction to dogma, in contradiction to the experts who get gained, supposed reveal truth to them. They actually are learning about the world, about reality by the use of their mind. And this, I think, manifests itself in ideas and in intellectuals and in philosophers rediscovering this idea of human reason. The idea that we as individuals have the capacity to know the world, have the ability to identify reality, have the ability to seek and discover truth. And as a consequence of that, we can live our own lives. We as individuals can discover truth. I think the whole idea that you know, Newtonian mechanics was not so complicated that a lot of people understood it. Once it was taught, once it was explained, people could figure it out. Hey, if I can understand these forces, why can't I choose what profession I should seek? Why can't I choose who to marry? Why can't I choose what to do with my life? Why can't I be the commander of my own life? Why do I have to listen to them? And why can't I choose them? to the extent that we need political leaders. Why, why did they just perpetuate themselves? Why, why am I not involved? I have a mind, just like everybody else. And the idea of human reason, and therefore of a human's ability to live their lives for themselves, in a sense, by themselves, was born. And the human being then making choices, choices for themselves. And the value of the individual, the idea that if the individual could think and the individual thinks for themselves, 
maybe there's value in the individual in and of himself. So the whole idea of individualism as an ideology, or as at least the beginning of an ideology, the idea that individuals are worthwhile or ends in, them, ends in themselves. And all of that comes together politically in these ideas about liberty and freedom. And, and what, is, what is freedom? You know, in the song, he says at the end, freedom, freedom, freedom. I mean, it's, I think it's, I mean, I find the song super powerful. I get tears in my eyes almost every time I listen to it. Um, I don't know if it has the same effect on everybody, but it, to me, it, it has a, a profound impact. And his, he's almost begging it, you know, he's demanding at the end, freedom, freedom, he's demanding it. But what is that freedom that they demand? Well, at the end of the day, it's that ability to make choices for yourself. It's the ability, freedom at the end of the day is using your reason, which we have. And, but you have to have that concept, using your mind to make judgments about the world, to make choices for yourself. Freedom is the ability to make those choices. Free of authorities telling you what you can and cannot do. Free of coercion, free of force, free of other people imposing their will on you. Freedom means your mind, your judgment, your values. You get to act on your rational decisions, your rational judgments, because you are rational, or at least you're capable of rationality. You're capable of reason. But without that concept, without that concept of reason, and without that concept of the value of individualism, there's no freedom. And it's exactly what these regimes lack. And sadly, I think it's, it's a lot of the world lacks, lacks today. So it's these ideas that then make it possible for the United States to come into being, for a declaration of independence to be written. We have an inalienable right, what? To live, to our life, which means to live your life based on your mind, based on your judgment, making choices in pursuit of your values. Liberty, the right to think and to act on those thoughts and to write and to express yourself and to convey ideas. Again, free of authorities and coercion and other people imposing themselves on you and the freedom to pursue your own happiness. Again, pursue your values, not some imposed happiness from above, which is what we're seeing in Iran. They would say, oh, we want you to be happy. This is how you should be happy. And if you're not happy this way, death to you, right? You're under the control of Satan or something. So America and the freedom, I think everybody today in the West and even beyond the West, broadly in the world today enjoys, even the Iranians and the Chinese demonstrators, I think, are manifesting those ideas that came out of that enlightenment. Now, the enlightenment of the 18th century, those ideas of, of reason and individualism. Now, the enlightenment was far from perfect. It was not perfect philosophically in terms of really providing a philosophical justification for these ideas. And it was also not perfect in impl implementation. We know, for example, at the founding of America, we had slavery. And it took another 50, 60 years of these ideas to continue to be integrated into a society to ultimately reject that completely. It took the British a little less. So in Europe, they eradicated it sooner, but ultimately, the contradiction between the idea of individualism and reason and slavery, that doesn't go together, had to, had to be resolved some way. And that it was resolved, unfortunately, at the cost of 600,000 lives, but it was resolved. The same goes for women. Women seem to be always the last. When, you, when you're speaking about liberty, they're always the first to be oppressed and the last to be free. And suddenly, that's the case in the West. You know, women's ability to sign contracts, to own property, and then ultimately to vote took another hundred years from the end of the Enlightenment, if you will. And it's a project. It's a project continues. It continues in our attitude towards today, in our attitudes towards uh, homosexuality, for example. That liberty, that application of liberty, that application of the concept of liberty, the concept of freedom, at least in the social realm, in our relationship between one another has, in 
vast parts of the West grown over this period of time. So that's where I think it came from. But whether you agree with me or not, to me is less important than the importance of the question and the importance that we investigate and the importance that we find an answer to what brought about this amazing phenomena that we have today, which is freedom and liberty for a significant portion of the population in the world. Not perfect, far from perfect. There are vast realms in which we are not free, in which our freedom is being reduced. But there are other realms in which we're amazingly free. And I think we lack an appreciation for how free we are. And you have to look at China, and you have to look at Iran, and you have to look at history to fully appreciate how good our lives are and how free we actually are. But again, to maintain that, to preserve that, it's important for us to understand how and why we, uh, we are where we are. Now, I think if we want to, um, I think one of our goals as human beings should be to, to see this freedom universalized. I mean, I think it's one of the reasons we look at a place like Iran and, and it rips our heart out, or we look at China and we see this amazing human potential. We see all these amazing young people and they're so limited. They're so restrained. And the, 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 the beauty of, of you know, bringing freedom and seeing it universalized, uh, that is, I think, a, an amazing goal and an amazing value for anybody who values their own life and therefore values the lives of other human beings because they recognize, they recognize the importance of that life, the value that that life represents to them. In order to do that, we have to know what freedom is about. We have to become advocates for liberty. We have to become advocates for freedom. I think to become advocates for liberty and freedom, we have to be advocates for reason and individualism, to be advocates for the ideas that make that freedom possible. I think these people are worthy of support, worthy of encouragement, worthy of our investment, worthy of us spending time just pointing out what is going on in the rest of the world and using it as an opportunity to introspect and appreciate our own lives appreciate those areas where we have all these choices, appreciate the areas where we don't. In America today, we have many liberties, and then there are other places that are restrained, primarily in the realm, I'd say, of economics, of business, of, of financial transactions. That's where it seems like that seems to have reversed itself. We had those liberties maybe early on, and those are the first ones to have reversed itself. But then what else? Uh, free speech under threat today. It seems that way. You know, our political liberties under attack these days. Well, maybe not yet, but certainly we're seeing the signs that maybe even that is under threat in the Western world. So let's appreciate the values, appreciate the, 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 the liberties and the freedoms that we have. I think seeing these scenes should cause us to rededicate ourselves to the fight for freedom, the fight for liberty, the fight for making those choices, the fight for having an ordinary life and living an ordinary life. Ordinary not in the sense of mediocre, ordinary in the sense of just taking for granted the freedom. I mean, it would be great if everybody in the world could just take for granted the freedom that they have. Of waking up every morning and not thinking about Oh, yeah, I can't wear this. I can wear whatever the hell I want. So it's an opportunity, I think, to seeing this as an opportunity to re-engage and to refocus and to rethink and to rededicate ourselves to a noble cause, the noble cause of freedom and liberty. Thank you. All right, there's a microphone over there. Hello. Hi. 
thank you for your talk. It was really enlightening and I really enjoyed it. Good. You know, I was thinking about, um, you were talking about freedom and how we should devote ourselves to a cause that um, requires and it yearns for our um, support, our encouragement, our investment. And I was wondering, just curious, if there's any reason why you decided not to um, mention the Palestine and Israel conflict in conjunction with Iran, China, Venezuela, Cuba, all that. Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, I purposefully uh, uh, didn't use the, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, partially because it is super complicated. Um, and it, I, it doesn't, I think, illustrate what I want to illustrate. That is, and I think, I think people would view it in reverse. That is, the typical view in which people look at the Palestinian-Israeli-Palestinian conflict is the, the Palestinians are oppressed, they lack freedom. Um, and uh, and uh, shouldn't we, if we support freedom, shouldn't we be supporting the Palestinian cause because they're the ones being oppressed, they're the ones not that lack the freedom. And I view it as the other way around. I view it as the, the, the Palestinians have rejected the concept of freedom. They rejected it explicitly. Um, and uh, and they, they have put this enormous, created this enormous threat um, uh, on the Israelis that has created the kind of disaster, the kind of disastrous situation that exists in the Middle East. So I think this applies to that conflict in a sense that it's time for the Palestinians to rebel against their political leaders. It's time for them to demand real freedom from their political leaders, which I think if they did would ally them much closer to Israel than it does to Hamas or to Abu Abbas or to any of their political leaders that exist today. Uh, but that's a much more complicated point than I was trying to get at. But, but thanks for asking. I, I think that's valuable. But you know, I think my view is um, that the Palestinians have basically been betrayed by their political leaders since 1940, well, actually probably go back to 1920s. And that they have bad political leaders that are basically have, have, have a vested interest in keeping the conflict going and by, by, by turning it into a tribal conflict um, and, uh, and that uh, they are, again, they've been betrayed by their leaders and if they demand freedom, it's from their leaders that they should demand that freedom. Thank you so much. Bye. Have a good one. Um, as I'm sure you know, um, it, there's a price for Western companies uh, to pay when they do business in China. And not in, in addition, they have to give up their intellectual property to Communist Party owned uh, enterprises, their, future, their, their individual competitors. They have to compromise on crew Western values, for example, um, for example, like Disney edits their, their films to, uh, to appease, uh, to appease sen uh, censors. Um, Google designs a version of the search engine that pur purposely omits Tiananmen Square, um, Taiwan, any other kind of sensitive uh, sensitive issue that the Communist Party designs controversial or sensitive. Zoom uh, Zoom repeatedly blocked a uh, blocked a meeting of of of. of of people who want to just commemorate June 4th a couple years ago. That was just like something completely discreet, but just seeing like Western companies bend over backwards to yep. uh, to chase profit margins in the uh, profit margins in, 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 because they have the have a huge market. Do you, what do you think is the ethical thing for uh, for Western companies to do when they try to do business in China? So I think it's very complicated and it's very hard for them. Um, so, I mean, much, many of the companies and much of what you just said is inexcusable um, and, and they shouldn't be doing, but I don't think, I don't think it's, it's that simple when um, almost today, almost every supply chain goes through China. I mean, it's almost impossible not to touch China in terms of doing business as much as you, as, as much as you would like to do it. Um, in a sense, decisions were made years, decades ago, and whether those were right decisions or wrong decisions, uh, that now put a lot of American businesses in a position where it's unbelievably, it's going to be unbelievably expensive to disengage. Now, Hollywood, for example, has started to disengage. So you're seeing more and more, because, because China made the mistake of not showing a lot of Hollywood movies in China. So they weren't getting the, the kind of revenues that Hollywood discovered that they could survive 
in spite of that. And today there's a lot less of that kind of self-censorship going on in Hollywood now than there was five, six years ago in pre-COVID times. Um, I think a lot, of, a lot of American large businesses are diversifying their supply chains and getting out of China, or at least moving operations out of China to other places. Um, Vietnam, which I'm not sure is, is, is the ideal place, India and, and other places. But it's, it's a very difficult situation to be in, particularly 10 years ago, right? Because 10 years ago, China really did look like it was moving in the right direction. It really did look like it, there, was a, there was real increases in freedom and that the increases in freedom and economics would ultimately spill into other freedoms. There was even, there was a lot more free speech in China 10 years ago than there is today. Uh, there was real opposition. There were people at universities teaching stuff that was clearly in opposition to what the regime uh, was advocating. And all of that has been reversed in the last Four, five, six and years. Since Xi Jinping came to power. What's that? Since Xi Jinping came to power. Well, even, it's not even when he came to power because it took him a while to establish himself to the point where he really started infringing. Originally, so people who are advocates of, of freedom and free markets in China, who I knew, when he first came into power, they thought he might be an honest anti-corruption guy. And they thought he was be, can be good. He, they thought they were very positive about him. And the first couple of years, it seemed like he was just going after really corrupt politicians. And then he turned against them. And many of them, you know, their, 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 their think tanks were shut down, they they closed, they were fired from the universities. Many of them had to come to the US, some of them are still in jail. So it, things changed about five, six years ago. Now, maybe that was foreseeable. Maybe some of us were naive and, and didn't see it coming, but it was a shift that was difficult to predict. And I think a lot of American businesses had assumed a certain thing. But look, the other aspect of this is so many of our businesses are basically run from a moral and philosophical perspective as pragmatic institutions without real uh, values and without real principles. And, you know, they don't know how to stand up. They don't know how to stand up to the regime here in the United States, never mind to a regime like China. It, once in a while, Google, I think, left China at some point when they were asked to do certain things that they didn't like, but then they came back. So it's, it's you know, some of them seem to stand up to it and then succumb. Um, after a while, it was this uh, very lucrative market. There were all these hundreds of millions of consumers, and they really were hundreds of millions of consumers. Partially, they, these consumers were created by the fact that American businesses went there and, and, and gave them jobs and, and provided them with, uh, with, with, with the wealth. Uh, I think today, any smart American business is trying to get out of China or trying to at least diversify away from China, partially for moral reasons, but at the same time also realizing that these moral reasons are gonna have a cost. Yeah. We're seeing that in Russia, right? If you went to Russia a few years ago, McDonald's went to Russia, built this massive business in Russia, incredibly profitable, and then suddenly they had, they, they, they had to shut it all down and leave Russia all at once. I don't think a lot of businesses want to be in that position vis-a-vis -vis China if China invades Taiwan, if something else happens that causes them to have to leave. So I think for both practical reasons and moral reasons, it makes sense for American businesses to start diversifying away from China. It can't happen quickly unless, you know, without these companies taking massive losses and really yeah. almost committing suicide. And I remain a free trader and for and for for engagement. And, and the historical argument for engaging with China was hoping when they integrate in the world economy, they will adopt Western values at, at some point. Uh, but we've seen with the, Xi, with the Xi Jinping regime and this it is common knowledge that the Communist Party like looks at the Soviet Union as a lesson, like they do not want that to happen to them. So that's what they that's what they personally want, want to avoid. But they, and the other thing I want to emphasize yeah. is like, I mean, I'm, I'm all for free trade, but free uh, exchange of ideas go, goes both ways. So like what I'm worried about is like, you see the self-censorship with American companies in appeasing the chi Chinese censors. I feel that could erode our institutions as well. I, I agree. I hate the self-censorship. I think it's 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 a betrayal of their values and I and I of American values, and I think it's horrible that they do it. But look, um, it's uh, China seemed to be adopting Western values, and it did in in many respects. It did. It, it, in in it, you know, if you went to China and you interacted with Chinese people, 
you know, they seem to be really adopting the kind of way of life of Americans, the values of Americans, the, the, the behaviors of Americans. And it seemed like the next thing that they would do is demand political freedom. And maybe they are, right? I mean, they were crushed in 1989 when they tried and that left real scars. I mean, real tens of thousands of, of a generation of young kids died, uh, not just in Beijing, but all over China. You know, we think of Tiananmen Square as just Tiananmen Square, but it was a, it was a, a, a revolution that was all over China. Um, but, you know, maybe they're starting up again. Maybe that revolution is still happening. I wouldn't give up on China and I wouldn't give up on the Chinese and I wouldn't give up on them really embracing ultimately these values. The regime wants to hold on no matter what. And that's been true since, uh, from the days of Mao and, and when Mao died. Deng Xiaoping's main thing was we need to stay in control. We'll, we'll, let, we'll give them some freedom, but we need to stay in control. And, and that, is, that is unfortunately, you know, what she is continuing. Yeah, and I still hope, hold hope as well. Yeah. Christine. Thanks for your talk. Um, so I had heard in the media of the Foxconn protests and the Iranian protests, but not the example you gave of the white page protest or the exodus from Cuba. I'm wondering if you have thoughts on the Western press and how they cover um, these kind of political uprisings around the world. Well, I mean, I think they cover the things, I mean, first they cover the things that they think their readers are interested in. So, I mean, it is a business and, and I think Americans generally have a low, uh, have, have, have generally are not that interested in what's happening in the world broadly. So you don't get a lot of international coverage in American media uh, more broadly. Um, you know, I, if, if, you, if you look at places like if you go to the UK, three quarters of this news is what's going on in the rest of the world. If you open up the Economist magazine, almost if you want to know what's going on in Africa, you're not going to find it in any publication in the US. But if you, you sit in the Economist magazine, there's a section in Africa every single week that it comes out. Um, so there's generally a disinterest in, in other countries, uh, a, relative, a relative disinterest in other countries. Um, but I think each one of those political issues represented a challenge for the American media. Um, there's, no, there's no clear constituency. I, I mean, even Iran, I thought the media covered it awful. I thought there was very little coverage. There wasn't a lot of coverage at all. I got a lot of my information from Iranian dissidents on Twitter and places like that, where they put up videos and you could see, in, you know, you could see what's really going on. There was very little coverage in the mainstream media. And then the alternative media, the, the kind of conservative media is not interested in Iran at all. You don't get anything in the conservative media about Iran. Even libertarians don't want to talk about Iran. Um, for, I think for a variety of reasons, partially because uh, oh, you know, it, the, there's this notion of every culture should do their own thing. Who are we to tell them? There's this rejection of absolutism. Uh, if, on this stage, I think I debated Yom Chazoni, uh, the National Conservative. If you read the National Conservative's manifesto, they say every country should do their own thing. We should intervene in one another. There are no absolute values. This value of freedom might be good for Americans. You guys might value it, this idea of free speech. But other peoples might not like freedom. So leave them alone. Let them not value freedom. Who are we? Who are we to, 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 so there's a lack of interest even on the right, particularly on the right. And then on the left, the left's been, you know, particularly the, 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 the extreme left has had always had certain sympathy with, uh, with the Iranian regime going back to all the way to uh, uh, It's really shocking that feminists, but again, feminists have this non-absolutism, right? What, what's good for us as women might not be good for them. They, you know, the, Maybe in their culture, it's okay to cover yourself up and, and be completely beholden to the man, right? It's just not good for us. So there's even the modern feminists are not absolutist in terms of their values. So there's no clear constituency for it. Um, they covered Iran a little bit because it was so visible. And I think some women did stand up and did, and did uh, um, uh, talk about it. Um, they didn't cover China much. Um, they didn't cover China much. You know, the reason they didn't cover Cuba they, didn't, they don't cover Cuba because they don't want to cover immigration. They don't really want to talk about what's going on with immigration. So you don't really get news. All the news you get in immigration is 
It's a flood, it's an invasion, they're coming and it's horrific. Uh, you have to really dig to figure out who's coming. Cubans, Venezuelans, Nicaraguans, people who are fleeing really authoritarian, oppressive, horrible regimes. That's who's been coming over the last year. Um, those are the dominant, uh, those are the three dominant groups. And Cubans, they have a problem because um, both the left and the right has a problem with Cubans, right? Because historically, the United States had this policy, if you're Cuban and you reach American soil, you're in, right? You don't have to apply for asylum, you don't have to anything. And then that was reversed by, I think it was Trump reversed that, or either Trump or Obama reversed that. And yet there's this big Cuban constituency in Florida, right, that they have to appease and they have to worry about. So they don't like to talk about all, you know, you know, there's a big camp on one of the keys where they're holding all these Cubans who are fleeing by boat. And there are more boat people on this uh, there that are all applying for asylum than they were when the big migrations. I mean, again, you have to dig to find this stuff, but nobody has an incentive because it's all so politicized. And it all has to fit into a particular story about what, who immigrants are and what they are and which constituency they belong to. And neither Democrats or Republicans really want to talk about immigration. Nobody wants to talk about immigration. So you don't get any of that if it has an implication in immigration. Um, so I think, I think the coverage has been awful. I, now, I will say that video uh, of the Chinese girl, that was in the Wall Street Journal either today or yesterday. So the Wall Street Journal's had some stories about what's going on in China. And I think the journal generally often is the better paper if, if, you, if you're looking for these kind of things that is often uh, has international coverage and does bring out some of these kind of stories more focused on freedom. Um, but yes, there's just no, Americans have, have, have always been quite insular in that respect. Thanks. Thanks for your talk, Dr. Brook. Uh, if politics, are really downstream ultimately from more fundamental ideas, as you've noted, how encouraged uh, can we really be by these phenomena that are breaking out in Iran and China and Russia? Uh, you and I both remember when the Berlin Wall came down and I really thought that within a few years, capitalism and freedom would break out all over. Um, I was, maybe I was irrationally exuberant about that, because obviously that hasn't really happened even 30, more, 30 plus years later. So I guess, oh. So here's the perspective you have to take on it. And it's, I mean, I remember Berlin Wall coming down and not thinking much of it because I was focused on the lack of liberty here, the lack of liberty now. And my standard was some objectivist world that I strive towards and I didn't think that the Berlin Wall would matter that much to achieving that. So I didn't pay it that much attention. Shame on me. Because the point of the Berlin Wall falling is not, does that help us achieve our utopian, uh, not utopian, but our, our goals in terms of political liberty in America. Hundreds of millions of people went from slavery to freedom. Yay. That's like so exciting. And why did they go from freedom to slavery? Because yes, they aren't objectivists. Yes, they haven't bought into all our ideas. But those ideas of the Enlightenment made it possible for them to appreciate the freedom that we had in the West. They could compare themselves to that. They had some memory of what it was like before communism and what life was like before communism. So this is not, you know, these phenomena going on in the world, they're not instrumental necessarily. We're not, we're not looking at them as instruments to achieving our goals. They're a beautiful thing in and of themselves because people are more free than they were before. And they're more free because of ideas. So it's wrong to think of these like the Iranians doing what they're doing, and this is devout of ideas. They might not have an explicit philosophy behind them, but they have an implicit philosophy that's basically telling them I should be able to make choices. And how do I know I should be able to make choices? Because I can see other people doing it. Because I, 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 from introspection, I know that I can make choices. And what's the reason that I can't? I don't believe in this religion stuff that they're, that, that they're cramming down my, my throat. So why should I have to pretend that I do? I, I want to live my own life. 
they are buying into the ideas of the Enlightenment, even if they can't say that it came from the Enlightenment. Ideas don't spread explicitly in a way that people downstream can go back and say, yes, I learned that from philosopher X, Y, Z. But they still are learning it from philosopher X, Y, Z. They're just learning it through the culture, through the accent, through the ideas that are kind of become implicit in a culture. And by them rejecting the same ideas that they, in, in, in many respects, the Enlightenment rejected 300 years ago, they are resurrecting those ideas. They are bringing those ideas to the forefront. And it's not that by doing that, we will become free. It's not like the Berlin Wall fell and it's cool because we'll become free. No, the Berlin Wall falling was cool because hundreds of millions of people became free. And so, so that's the orientation. And then it's an opportunity now to bring our ideas to the forefront, to continue the battle, to, to, to talk about freedom, to show, yes, communism fa uh, failed, but that's not the end of the story. There's still a lot of bad ideas other than communism that we have to fight to show that our ideas are the correct ideas. I mean, there's a, this is, requires constant vigilance, but now we have X hundred of thousands of people out there in the world who are not slaves, and that's cool. And that's, it makes them now open to our ideas. There's, there's more, I, I'll just tell you, because of the Berlin Wall falling, there's more in, falling, there's more interest in Ayn Rand in Eastern Europe than there maybe is in, in the US right now. You know, I, I don't know if, some of you know this, but Atlas Shrug was the best selling book in Ukraine in 2015 and 2016. Literally the best selling book. It came out in three volumes. Every time it came out as a volume, it was number one in the best selling bestseller list. Um, it was, it sold really well in Russia. Didn't have the same impact in Russia, but it sold really well in Russia. So, but that wouldn't have been possible if not for the Berlin Wall falling. But the most important thing about the Berlin Wall falling is they got to be free and that's cool. Thanks. Can you speak to the current trends and attitudes about freedom and modernity in the West? and how that might relate to the silence towards Iran? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that uh, the silence is to a large extent explained by our own move away from the ideas that make liberty and freedom uh, possible and important. There's rejection of the idea of free speech, I think, across the political spectrum. There's some people kind of who, who need to identify left or right who, who are still advocating for, for free speech. But there's, uh, you know, whether it's woke on the one side or whether it's uh, uh, the national conservatives or the integralists or whatever on the right, and they all want to silence us one way or the other, and they certainly want to silence each other, right? They want to limit the boundaries. Um, there's a certain resistance on the far right, for example, today to criticize Iran. Why? The Iranian regime is just applying their particular religion to their culture and their society. What we would like to do is apply our particular religion to our culture and our society. So we can't criticize them because then that would be an implicit criticism of us. And the idea that there's something called universal rights or universal truths or universal ideas is unpopular across the political spectrum. So it's very difficult to criticize another country and another people on the basis of a standard that you don't believe exists. There really is a, a dearth of people who believe that there's some kind of universal universality to truth and universality to, um, um, to morality. And there is generally, you know, look, look at the sympathy even Putin gets on both extreme left and extreme right today, right? For, for different reasons. Standing up to America, that the left loves that, that he's standing up to the West, he's standing up to America. And on the right, he's anti-gay. And they, you know, that's that they, they, you know, some of them like that. He represents the true Western civilization, the true values of Western civilization. And they like that on that side. So there is a rejection of our own, there's a rejection in the West of reason as universal. There is a, you know, a, a rise again in a kind of platonic notion of we need we need people to govern us we need people to rule us again both on the left and the right we're seeing that across the political spectrum uh, there's a rejection of individualism we've become tribal 
And once you abandon individualism and you accept tribalism, then my tribe is my tribe and your tribe is your tribe and you do what the hell you want in your tribe. Again, you abandon the idea of universality and, and, and universal values. Oh, talk is much appreciated. I wanted to ask, um, you talk a lot about American history and uh, the connection to these movements. Why do you think they haven't grabbed on to examples like uh, the civil rights movement and other kind of language to kind of uh, bolster their cause or their um, movement or advocacy? It's a good question. Um, I think partially they probably don't know that much about the civil rights movement. Would be like, I mean, how many Americans know that much about the civil rights movement? Um, you know, what the Iranians... What the Iranians know is, is, is probably quite limited in terms of American history. Uh, and it, certainly that's, pro that's probably true in China with the exception of those who, who've, who've come here to study maybe and spend some time in the United States. Um, I also think it's very different. Um, you know, the idea of, uh, of, of, for example, the civil rights idea of, civil, of, of peaceful protest, I mean, <laughs> I mean, even in the U.S., it, the authorities didn't always leave it and let it be peaceful. But imagine what, what the Iranian regime, which is willing to take out machine guns and just mow people down and has and has in the past and, and, and seems to be inclined to do in the future. Imagine what the Chinese would do with that. And I also think that, you know, the intellectuals leading the civil rights movement were intellectuals. Martin Luther King was an intellectual. I just, I just um, read a speech he gave on, um, it was the anniversary of Lincoln's um, emancipation speech, where he links, he links the whole, uh, the, the civil rights movement to the ideas of the Declaration of Independence. And he talks about individual rights, and he talks about the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I mean, I mean, I wish there was anybody in the political sphere today in America that talked to, the way Martin Luther King did. This was in 1962. So this was before the Civil Rights Bill. And it's a beautiful speech. Not only everything he said was beautiful, but it was, I mean, I agreed with almost everything, which is not always true with Martin Luther King. But here I agreed with almost everything. These movements are not led by intellectuals. Certainly in Iran, it's not led by intellectuals. This is really grassroots. This is people just saying we're fed up. We're pissed off. We won't accept this anymore. We don't want it anymore. We're getting up and we're, we're, we're fighting against this. And in that sense, I think, I think the, the civil rights movement would be very different if it didn't have not just intellectuals, but I think uh, at the top, some really, you know, really, really smart intellectuals who knew their history, who knew America and understood some of these principles and could apply them to the particular case and knew how to appeal to Americans in a language that Americans understood and therefore could get people on their side. Uh, I think here, there, there's nobody to get on your side. Look, maybe this is the more important answer. In, you know, in America, there's this, there was a vast number of people who basically wanted to be on the side of the, I think the civil rights and then they needed the language and they need to understand the cause and they need to understand what was going on. When you're talking about, and even the administration, right, even at the top, right, people were ultimately sympathetic. Who's sympathetic in, at the top in Iran? I mean, the reason why this has so far gone nowhere, I think, in Iran, and, and the fear is that it won't go anywhere in the near Iran, is that there's nobody in a position of authority that has sympathies. There's nobody in a position of authority that wants to help these people. There's nobody... It has to come from the military. It has to come from somebody who can actually implement a revolution. Um, the civil rights movement, it, you know, got the American people behind them, and that's how they succeeded in that. Thank you very much. I was, if this could be real quick, um, is there any? Could you talk about how maybe America's actions make them complicit in the growth of Iran or China? Everybody talks about how China is super strong and super powerful and all this stuff. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, you know, it's a different topic, but Iran as constituted today shouldn't exist. 
Um, and, and, and it's America's, uh, America's fault that it does in many respects. I mean, it's America's fault that it allowed 1979 to happen and, and that it allowed uh, Iran to bully the United States back then and didn't, and didn't take a, 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 the proper uh, approach to Iran, you know, whether in 79 or 9-11 or Salman Rushdie or, you know, there's so many circumstances in which the United States should have acted stood up for the values of liberty and freedom um, and allowed this regime just to, just to trample on us, never mind its own population, that we have, to a large extent, have some moral culpability in the existence of that regime. China, I think, uh, you know, there's a, there's a long history with China. Um, some of it I know and some of it I don't. I think it's more complicated with China because, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it wasn't obviously an enemy of the United States when it opened up, it wasn't obvious what the right thing to do was, whether to, 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 to allow Americans to go in there and trade or not. It, you know, so it's, I, I think it's a lot more ambiguous in terms of how to think about China. It's a lot more difficult. Uh, it seems that uh, you know, about three years ago, we saw a substantial portion of the American population who were willing to sacrifice the rule of law, liberty, and, and a lot of other constitutional liberties over absolutely nothing. Uh, what is your reaction to that? The, the fact that we deal with people who openly hate liberty or, you know, say a sadistic and violent sociopath like Sam Harris, who still supports all this nonsense. So you're talking about lockdowns? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I was horrified and shocked by the fact that Americans didn't respond um, the way the Chinese responded now. But of course, the Chinese, it took them also three years in order to, to, to get to the point where they responded. I mean, lockdowns were an example of um, complete denial of freedom and liberty. Uh, maybe initially uh, people were, were confused and afraid and, and let it happen because they were too afraid of the alternative. But within a few months, it was obvious that this was just a way, this, this was just a, a massive overreaction and massive control that American people had never seen before. Uh, it, 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 was, it was clearly horrific. But, I, I, you know, and it's, it's taken a long time. I don't think, I wonder if they could get away with it now. I don't think they could with the lockdowns. Um, and I think that overall in the world, generally, what we've seen, it's been much slower than I'd like. But, you know, Europe threatened to lock down again in, in 2021. And there were massive demonstrations in almost every city in Europe. And ultimately, in 2022, they all backed down. Every single one of those European countries backed down. I think in the United States, if they threatened lockdowns, there would be significant demonstrations and they would back down from it very, very quickly. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's upsetting and disappointing that it took that long for people to figure it out. Uh, I think there are a variety of reasons for that, that this is not, you know, sometime we can get into, but um, there are a variety of reasons for it. But I think people have woken up at least to that particular attack on liberty. You know, the next one, who knows? Um, but it's not gonna be easy to lock Americans or Europeans for that matter down again anytime in the near future. And you saw that with a, with a massive opposition to lockdowns in Europe, which is surprising. Europeans are usually pretty, pretty uh, accepting of these things. But it was horrific. It was the biggest violation of, of liberty in a, in a very long time uh, for Americans. Oh, hey, Garen. Uh, thanks for the talk, very inspirational. Uh, big fan of the uh, YouTube show you have. What's that? Uh, the YouTube show you have. I'm a big oh, fan. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yes. Yeah, so I wanted to ask you. So you mentioned that we should think about what makes like our life extraordinary. I was wondering if maybe self-esteem plays a big factor in the sense that, well, if you're going to be trying to understand the world and use your reason, you're very likely to fail over and over. And that will maybe cause you to self-doubt and lead you maybe to think, oh, maybe I should trust like an external force or another person like this philosopher king that will give me the answers. So do you agree with that statement? And if you do, do you think there is like a systematic way as a culture to build self-esteem? So yeah, I definitely agree with that statement that self-esteem matters. It's, it's crucial. And it's self-reinforcing. 
That is, uh, if you fail and fail and fail and, and you don't learn from your failures and, and, you, and the system is such that it, it encourages you to fail and not succeed, then you become reliant on the system and you abandon your own, your own value and you lose, you lose whatever self-esteem you have. And yes, and you become more, uh, it becomes much easier to control you and, and manipulate you. Um, the same is true, I think, the other way around. If, if, you, if you're successful and it's a, the system is such where when you fail, you learn from that failure and, and you know, you're, not, you're not penalized, uh, and you're not crushed by the failure, uh, and, but when you're successful, you get a benefit from those successes and you learn that, you know, that you're capable, that you're able. So in that sense, you know, capitalism uh, uh, reinforces self-esteem. It, 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 you know, there's a, there's a virtuous loop there that, that happens and, and authoritarian regimes have, a, have, a, have a, a cycle of vice. What is amazing to me just in this issue is, look, for these kids to stand out there, for these kids to say what they are saying and do what they're doing requires some self-confidence, requires some level of self-esteem that in spite of this system has been crushing them, they still have some self-love, respect for themselves and self-confidence to be able to stand up to the authorities and do what they're doing, both in China and in, in so that's inspiring that they can do that. What was the other aspect of your question? Um, systematic way to build self-esteem. I, think I mean, the systematic way to build self-esteem is to have rational values and to work, work to achieve them, recognize their achievement, recognize that you achieve those values in a sense recognize that you did something worthy and that is how you build self-esteem. You build self-esteem through achieving your values and recognize that too many people achieve values but never take the time to, 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 to self-reflect and recognize the fact that they achieved it and view it as a positive that they achieved the values. They, you know, and this is like people who say they're on this uh, career, you know, you, you, you get to one peak and then you get to, you know, you immediately on the next peak. And I, and it's like a rat race. You're constantly running around in circles and you're not achieving anything. But that's a mentality thing. Of course, you're achieving something. You keep reaching peaks. Anytime you reach that peak, you've achieved something. And you should, cool, I, I, I got something. And this is great. And this is, I'm enjoying it. And this is fun. And this is, that's how you get that self-esteem. And people who, people who forget to, to appreciate that and to recognize that uh, often um, don't gain the self-esteem that they deserve. Thank you. Yeah. Um, my question is, uh, do you think freedom is a Western product that needs to be imported by non-Western societies or because you were talking about Greece and the Renaissance yeah. and yeah. the birth of freedom, or do you think it's a natural progression of any human society uh, from and a authoritarian uh, origin to um, a free society yeah. due to it being an intrinsic human value. So I don't think it's a necessary progression of any society. Um, and, and there's no evidence to suggest that there is that kind of progression that just happens naturally. I think it is a consequence of certain discoveries about the world that happened to have taken place in a particular geographic place called you know, Western Europe or Greece and then Western Europe. And, and whether Greece is really Western in, in, in the geography of the time is not clear, but it's, it's, it's clearly ideas that, 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 uh, you know, that uh, uh, create this value that is freedom. It's ideas that you discover these ideas and you discover that your freedom is a value. We're not born with freedom in our hearts. Indeed, many, many cultures repeatedly adopt unfree uh, systems and uh, you can go and help them. You can try to, you could try to, um, you could try to bring them freedom. I mean, that was the whole Bush campaign, right? Uh, bringing freedom to the Middle East by military force. It doesn't work that way. You can't bring people freedom. It's the ideas and they have to discover those ideas and it's work that they have to do. There's no shortcuts. You can't do the work for them. You, and so by saying it comes out of the West doesn't mean that it's uniquely Western in the sense of there's something unique about Western man that only, 
it just happened to have come out of the West for particular historical reasons is a reason why it was there. Um, but it is universal. It applies to all human beings. And it, all cultures should and can learn these ideas and apply them in their own context. I mean, the, the most successful economies today in Asia, uh, you know, have adopted Western ideas, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, Japan, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, Hong Kong before the, the, the Chinese took them over and to the extent that China was successful. because So ideas are ideas, they're good ideas, you want to embrace those, they're bad ideas, you don't want to embrace those. Where they come from is less important than the truth of the idea or, or, or the falsehood of that idea. Okay. So, but just so there's a set of truths that was discovered by people in Western Europe, in modern times at least, by people in Western Europe. And yes, everybody in the world should embrace them no matter where they live. Do you think they would have been discovered uh, if the West did not discover them? Do I think they would have discovered if the West had not discovered? Yes, I think they would have ultimately. I mean, I mean, the, the, the point, if, if, if you think about it, a lot of these ideas were beginning to be discovered by the Muslim world in the, uh, between the 9th and the 12th centuries, and, but they gave up on them. But they were there. They're the seeds of all of that were there in the Muslim world during that period. They discovered Greece. So it happened all starting in Greece. Right? But once it started with Greece, it's a question of which which cultures adopt, took those ideas and built on them, and which cultures ignored those ideas and abandoned them, particularly the ideas of Aristotle. Um, and, 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 but, but the whole idea of philosophy and, 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 and trying to discuss and science, those start in Greece. And uh, cultures that adopt that and build on it do well, and cultures that ignore that do poorly. And, the, and I think the best historical example of that is Islamic culture. Of, of the early Muslim empires, which started to build on those ideas and did very, very well. The best libraries in the world were in Baghdad, uh, you know, the, 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 and, and they were incredibly successful and they were advancing in science and mathematics and all these areas. And then they give it all up in the name of religion. So it's, it, it really is, it has nothing to do again with uh, particular genes of the, you know, of, of, the, of the tribe that it has to do with discovering truth. Thank you. So your, your primary topics today were China and Iran, and I definitely see in both cases the people rising up against government oppression and rising up for freedom of expression and freedom of speech, uh, but are you seeing any uh, emphasis on uh, private property or economic freedom? And are you hopeful that sort of implicit in those uprisings, like you may see a better hope for those concepts or will Iran, if it ever does get out of its totalitarian hellhole, just become another sort of socialist government that doesn't respect property rights at all? So I, I, doubt, I doubt that Iran would descend into kind of a, a, a socialist place where they don't respect property rights at all, right? Uh, emphasis on at all. Uh, it, it just, I think, would be uncharacteristic to the kind of, um, let's say, individualistic demands these people are making. I mean, once you, once you want to wear your own clothes and talk, say your own things, you also want to own your own property. And, and now, not fully property rights, as, as we understand them, nobody in the world protects them fully, but I expect that there will be a mixed economy like everybody else, but a mixed economy is a thousand times better than an oppressive one. Um, China, um, China depends which road it goes and, and, and how it develops, but certainly I think there's potential. I think Chinese understand private property. Um, they live in a regime that recognizes kind of a pseudo private property. It's private property as long as you don't piss them off. And as soon as you piss them off, it's no longer your property. It's theirs. And they'll take it without any rule of law. So there's a lot of steps that they have to take in order to get there. But I can't, you know, China's more likely to become socialist under Xi, who's talking about inequality and redistribution of wealth and well, he wants to establish a welfare state rather than from, from, from generally the public. Um, but 
Are they going to be capitalist? No. I mean, again, they'll probably be, if, if to, tomorrow you got elections in China, and you know, they'd be a mixed economy like everyone else, because that's what there is. I mean, they're, 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 they're basically, uh, you know, there is, there is nothing else. There's no model for anything else that they recognize. And again, they don't have the full philosophical framework to fully understand the implications of the whole thing. So I think the best we can hope for in these countries is they become more like us, which is, you know, I, I know I'm not supposed to say this, but it's pretty good. Again, relative to what the other option is, it, this is damn good. And that's part of what I want to be trying to convey this for years is, is don't be too down on what we have and, 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 and how good life is today. We want it better and we should definitely be fighting for better. And we want, definitely want to strive for better. And it could be a lot better. But, you know, from an historical perspective and a cross-sectional geo, geopolitical perspective, it's not bad. Uh, actually, following up on what you just said, I wanted to ask, like, how do you think it can be better? Because like, one big criticism with capitalism is just like how it exploits workers with like slavery and then child exploitation and sending the Mexican workers here and then send, forcibly sending them back through repatriation and also the, the prison industrial complex currently going on now that like, heavily focuses on minorities and people of color. So how do you think we can truly improve our capitalist system so I think the way to improve the system. So first, I, I, I'll, I'll disagree with some of what you said. I, I don't think slavery was capitalist. I think slavery is anti-capitalist. Uh, and it is, it's indeed the capitalist North fighting the, the feudal South. The South is feudal. Slavery is a feudal phenomenon, not a capitalist phenomenon. I don't think capitalism built an exploitation of labor. Um, I, I think it was the liberation of labor that they built on. You know, Dickens has it upside down. Marx has it upside down. Most of your professors have it upside down. So I, I, let me first say that, but I think if you're asking about moving forward, the way to move forward is, is more freedom, more liberty and more individualism, more respect for property rights and, and more freedom. So um, what was the example you gave of to, for, for today? Um, God, I can't even remember the, 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 everything you said. So, so what would you say about something today that was uh, oh, not the, the prison industrial complex? Yeah, take the prison industrial complex. I mean, first of all, why are there so many people in prison? To a large extent, there's so many people in prison today because of, of, a, of a war on an inanimate object, uh, the war on drugs. So, uh, you know, if you legalize drugs and you made drugs just a commodity, which is what they are, and uh, prices would drop, you get rid of gangs, you get rid of the violence, but you also get yourself land up not having several million people in jail who are there for drug offenses, uh, many of them with victim, you know, that don't have a victim, uh, not in the sense of, of, of force, not in the sense of rights violation. So once you start trimming down the laws so that the laws actually reflect the protection of individual rights, which I think is the only basis on which laws, laws should be there to protect individual rights and not to try to control our behavior, then a lot of the issues around prisons go away because the population of the prison shrinks dramatically. Basically, then you have prisons with violent offenders and people who commit fraud and people who are really bad people, people who really violated other people's rights, have, have done harm to other people. And once that prison population, that's the entire prison population, you know, how exactly you deal with them, we can talk about, but it's much smaller and it's certainly not an industrial complex because it's so small, right? Um, so, if you start treating people as individuals and you start limiting government to only protecting individual rights and not intervening in our lives, then I think you get a superior outcome. But that, that involves an entire revolution in the government. I was just looking at these statistics. In 1929, the federal government spent 3% of GDP. Today, the United States government spends, I mean, this 2022, it spent 25% of GDP. So we've gone from 3% to 25. So the, the, the federal government has grown 10x, close to 10x, right? I'd like to see it back to like three to 5% of GDP. A lot would be different in our world if we did that. And that means, there, I think that means there would be a lot more jobs, there would be a lot more wealth, we would be a lot richer. Uh, you know, there would be many, many more opportunities for people today who feel like there are no opportunities before them. There'd be a lot more social mobility, wealth mobility, people going up and down 
in the income bracket, there'd be a lot more freedom from a, a business perspective, from an economic perspective. So the movement has to be towards shrinking government to protecting our rights and leaving us alone otherwise. The movement has to be towards freedom. That's what freedom means. It's, it's, it's allowing us to use our judgment to make decisions for ourselves in pursuit of our values, whether it's in the economic realm, in business, employment, right? We should be able to cut a deal pretty much, you know, for me to employ you, you to employ me at whatever terms we want. Why is this third party interfering here and telling me how much I need to pay you, how much you pay me, or, or what benefits we pay, or a million different regulations that we have to deal with that suppress the number of people I'm going to employ, which limits the amount of jobs, which limits the amount of opportunities that people have. And you could go on from there for millions of examples. That's one, one follow up before that. Um, do you think they should, like the government before like it shrinks, do you think they should reinvest into like certain like minority or historically oppressed neighborhoods? Because of like, there have been a lot of different policies that were specifically targeting these minority neighborhoods to prevent them from building wealth. And also mm -hmm. like with the 13th Amendment, with the never really freed the slaves. Yeah, there's, well, there's no question slavery. that there was yeah. redlining laws and there was a, all kinds of laws that restricted investment and development in certain minority areas. The solution to that is not reverse redlining. It's not suddenly to take from some and give to others and redevelop them. The solution is, is freedom. The solution is to eliminate all those restrictions, eliminate all that, and let the market actually work. Now, that won't cause a flood of money suddenly to come in but it'll cause a flood of opportunities to be created and allow people to rise up by themselves, which I think going back to the self-esteem issue is the way people gain self-esteem. They rise up by themselves, not because somebody gave them money because 50 years ago, something bad happened. Um, but there's no question. A lot of thinking needs to go into how to heal, you know, real racial wounds that are real, that are not pretend, that I don't think America is fully reckoned with. Right? But I don't think the way to do that is by throwing money at the problem because I don't think it was ever about the money. I think the way to do that is to eliminate the barriers for people to rise up, to eliminate the barriers to opportunities given to people who haven't had those opportunities in the past. So let's just get rid of all the restrictions, liberate people to be able to engage in transactions with one another. And while recognizing the past, you know, uh, appreciating and, and condemning, in some cases, the past moving forward. And I think that should be the orientation. Thank you. All right, we'll make this the last question. I took this class, Philosophy of Freedom, in my undergrad, and there was a professor who he taught um, the Fountainhead there, incidentally. But he mentioned he was an advisor in, I think, Ukraine, some Eastern European country where they were trying to set up a more free government, maybe in the 90s. Yeah. Um, and he said that when he tried explaining the market system and how, um, <clears throat> like how you could just go buy an apartment, it just like blows their mind. And he said they decided that freedom really meant you would get three choices for which apartment you would be able to live in or something like that. It seems like when, when there's some sort of change in government, it's hard to like land on a good government. And I'm just curious if you have any advice uh, for how to influence these decisions that get made when these things are actually successful. Oh, I don't know how to influence decisions. If I knew how to influence decisions. Um, I think that just shows how difficult this concept of freedom is. For, for most of humanity, most of the time, and how, you know, it, it's, it's, it's unique. Uh, it, it's unique over the last 200 years that we've had even some conception of what freedom is and some idea of it. But yes, I find that a lot of the people who grew up under the, under the Soviet system um, can't conceive of choices. And they think choices are burden. So I had... Uh, when I was in Israel, I had a, a, a foreman working for me as a construction engineer in those days. I had a former working for me who had immigrated to Israel from the Soviet Union. And he'd come with his family and his family loved Israel. They thought it was a blast and he hated it. He said, I hate this place. There are too many choices. I, I, can't, I can't manage. He says, you go into the grocery store and, and there's 75 different, well, this is Israel. So there were five different types of toilet paper. Oh, I just need one. Now I'm spending time choosing which toilet paper. This is a waste of my time. What do I need this for? And 
I have to make decisions all the time. I have to choose. I have to value things. I have to use my mind. I mean, that's not his words. That's my words. But, but yeah, I mean, that was that, that mentality is, was inculcated in people in, in the Soviet Union. And it took, again, I mean, you, you know, I, I was thinking about talking about the fall of the Berlin Wall, because think about, think about how they had to break away from that mentality to advocate for what they advocated for, for the demonstrations, starting with, starting with the end of revolutions in, in 56 and in uh, 56 and 64, I think. Uh, in in Prague and in um, in Budapest, and then uh, but then you know people going out in the streets in the 1980s and solidarity and all of that, and they in spite of this mindset that so many people had, some people still had a grasp of this idea that no choices are good, freedom is a good thing. I want more options. I want to be able to make choices for myself, and I want to get rid of this system. It's hard for people to to get there. And, and we should appreciate when they do. And then we need to help them take that next step of, okay, if you want choices over this stuff, what about over that? What about being able to really choose how you live your life and who to associate with and who not and who to walk away from and who not? How, do you, how, do you, how about freedom all out, complete, you know, consistent? But that's the process in which we're living. The Enlightenment, again, went through a process of applying freedom to different groups, I, you know, we need to work for the next evolution of that in terms of consistently, uh, consistently fighting for applying freedom to more and more areas of our life. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Brook. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, this talk was a part of the objectivism program at the Salem Center, where we have um, speakers talking about or from the perspective of Ayn Rand's philosophy. We also have a podcasts that we live tape here, podcast discussion uh, on Tuesdays at, at 5.30. If you go to the QR code there, you'll find out more information. Everyone's welcome to attend that, sign up and learn about our future events. There's also um, a club on campus. We can switch the slide up for that for people who want information about the uh, Ayn Rand Club and other places to discuss and find out more about these kinds of ideas. Uh, so please, people who are interested, sign up. And anyone who isn't already, I also encourage you to subscribe to the Iran Brook show on YouTube or your favorite podcatcher. Uh, thanks again, everyone for coming. And I hope to see you at a future event. Soon.